Oh, some vegan shitty party, oh, some vegan shitty party, oh, some vegan shitty con county preparation for four people. Get one hello the there, hello there, hello there, YouTube. How the devil are you all? Hi, well, I was rather well. Um, but I've been doing and it seems twice, which is a little annoying. And firstly, I was, at this time, uh, I was supposed to be doing a hangout with uh, Blair White. And that's, um, that didn't end hey, up Hey, hey, hey. Oh, hello. I've just been interrupted during my intro mm -hmm. by uh, the beautiful Ms. Winters. How the yeah. devil are you? Uh, I'm, I'm good, but it's like late at night and I'm in my gym jam, so it's dark on where I am. <laughs> no camera for me. Yes, uh, uh, well, yes, I was just explaining to people, um, uh, I was supposed to be doing a thing with Blair White, that didn't happen. Uh, and I thought I'd been stood up by you as well, which would have been surely a first cross-continental jiltings. Oh, yeah. Jiltings uh, in the same. It was just a bad link. And so uh, I got sent into a call room, and then we finally connected up, and now here I am interrupting your flow. Yes. Well, and I couldn't be happier that it's you interrupting uh, my flow, although that sounds weird now. Anyway, um, yes, this isn't really about anything. This is just, I was I was in the mood. And sort of, um, I built myself. I thought up. you said you were in the nude. <laughs> but then, no. It yeah, was a long was, yeah. nude. A bit. It's really mixed because my grasp of the English language is not great when I'm sober, and I'm not sober. So, there's that. Um, I've been doing the Blair White thing, but um, I thought, fuck, it seems though she said, uh, she, and to be fair, like, she said something to come up and she'll reschedule. I'm not going to hold my breath, but it doesn't really matter either way. I was just going to tear into her, so you know, um, I, I wasn't so much going there to, to debate her as I was to fucking drag her, basically. But anyway, uh, that, that hasn't happened. So I thought, well, I'll do a thing and just put the link in. We've got a little group thing with some people. And I'll put it in there and see who pops up. Uh, and Christy said she wanted to, to do it. So, hello there, Dr. Winters. Hello. Back from Germany oh, after yeah. spending... Ooh, feedback. Uh, back from Germany... <laughs> God, sorry. Lots of feedback. <clears throat> sorry. I'm uh, yeah, home again after four weeks in the field doing research. Actually still finishing up a few post-election focus groups. But, uh, wow. What a, what a time to have been in living in the UK in the last month. Yeah, yeah. And and you've left and everything's turned to shit, frankly. Well, uh, it was kind of, yeah. yeah, it was kind of on the die ward slug when I was there. So I don't think I, I helped in any way to prevent or uh, alter the course of history by the butterfly effect of my presence. But, um, exactly. And also the fact that it's happened under a female prime minister clearly shows that women cannot lead. I think that has been, that has been conclusively proven there. <laughs> Definitely. Well, it is very interesting because um, if you look around the political leadership of British or UK, I should say, uh, political parties, you've got Theresa May, you've got Nicola Sturgeon, um, Ruth, uh, what's her name, who's leading the Scottish people up in... Um, Davison. Yes, yes, I want to say Davies, but I know that's not it. And the leader of the DUP is a woman too, I believe. Yes, Arlene Foster, uh, and of course the leader of Plaid Cymru, whose name has totally escaped oh, me. Oh, Leanne Wood. Leanne Wood, yeah. Uh, so yeah, there, there are all all the three major parties in Scotland are led by uh, WOMs. Um, the leader of the government is a WOM, uh, and and as well, there isn't really technically a devolved government in Northern Ireland at the moment. But if there were, it would be Arlene Foster. Um, so yeah, there there are lots of lots of women in powerful positions, which in general is good. And actually, I was gonna I was gonna do a video about this. Um, I don't know if you're aware of a, a British feminist uh, YouTuber called um, Claudia Bolin. No, I'm not. But, um, Tell me about her. Uh, yeah, you should. She's actually very good generally, but I was going to make a video in response to her. She put out a video just before the election, actually. Uh, and she generally she's sort of relatively lefty, as you might imagine. Um, but um, she put out a video defending uh, Theresa May on the basis that uh, one, of the th one of the things that was put out about her was that she was she's sort of cold, she's not very approachable, she, just, she doesn't smile a lot, and so on and so forth. Uh, and Claudia did the thing, which I think in general is true. But in the case of public servants, I think you can expect slightly more. Uh, where uh, she was, she was going down the line of, oh well, women don't owe you a smile, women don't owe you a reaction, 
for any particular reason, blah, blah, blah. And I think in general that's true. If you're just a random woman walking down the street, yes, they don't owe you a smile, they don't owe you any reaction. But when you're asking to run the country, you're asking people to, to put that amount of faith in you, I think a smile isn't the end of the world to expect, is it? No, you're trying to win people over. And the way we tend to do that yeah. as primates is by a, a smiling motion on our face and genuine happiness in our eyes. Yeah. Yeah, well, not just no. that, but even even if you you don't really care about the individuals or the, the the people of your nation, you at least have to try and pretend to care, sure, mate. Right? I don't know, that's too much to expect. No, but, and you know, know um, maybe. you know, I was young enough to support Al Gore when he was running for, or old enough, I should say, I'm old enough to have supported Al Gore when he was running for president. And you know, he got hit up on the same thing of being stiff and kind of, you know, not very warm and not very human and relatable. Uh, there is a case to be made that fem- female leaders or women who run for political office do face a never an extra level of scrutiny on their looks. That's a totally legitimate complaint. Yeah. But I think to say that a politician running for office shouldn't, you know, um, sh- should somehow be expected not to smile at you just seems to go against what the whole purpose of being a politician is. Yeah. yeah, I was actually going to bring up, I'm not going to do the video in the end, but uh, one of the points I was going to bring up was an actual example of the way in which women are treated in a bad way. And in regards to Theresa May, just before uh, having talked about um, the, the First Minister of Scotland, basically the Scottish version of the Prime Minister anyway, even though Scotland, ha- the Prime Minister of Britain is also the Prime Minister of Scotland, it's complicated. Anyhow, um, they had like a summit about Brexit. Um, because there's certain powers that are devolved, and so there's, there has to be some link up between Westminster and the, and the parliaments in the um, in the other countries. Uh, and a, a full, strong um, women who've gone to the top of their, their professions, uh, you think they'll be treated with a certain amount of respect. But the Daily Mail, which is the second largest selling newspaper in the country, uh, and a, a right-wing shit rag of double shit baggery, um, put on the front page of its uh, uh, paper on the day or the day after whatever reporting on this legs it which is obviously a play on the word brexit because the two women had dared to wear skirts not even particularly short skirts really conservative you didn't see of the four knees between the two women you didn't see a single knee so it was very conservative uh, skirts but you could see a bit of leg and so they focused on the fact that they had their legs out yeah and on the, front, on the front page and you think no man would ever be treated that that derisively well, just think back to Blair's, uh, Blair's Babes, right? Yeah, exactly. Well, exactly yeah. Of, that was, um, I mean, up until up until this um, general election, uh, Blair's Babes, which is the name for the female intake of MPs in like, the Labour's landslide in '97, uh, and there were up until uh, this election, I think 2005 was the most in, female MPs there had ever been. Blair's Babes, um, and they were they were treated like sort of dolly birds, basically. Yeah. Powerful women who've I mean, they've not got to the top of their profession, but they've become, you know, elected representatives, treated with a certain amount of fucking dignity. I mean, if they do something wrong, by all means, criticise. I think that's perfectly fine. They're public servants, but don't. You would never treat men in that in that way. It's. I mean, it really is disgusting for anyone. And so I was going to juxtapose that to the sort of nonsense of wanting to smile. Right. Yeah. And I, and I get. And I get the general the general thing. What the? Do you remember that the uh, brilliant uh, piece of footage that was shot of the woman walking around New York? And the harassment she received. I think, yeah. yeah, if you're a random person walking down the street, well, actually, no one should ever have to put it with that. But I mean, specifically in terms of wanting a reaction or feeling you're entitled to some reaction. But when you're looking for the highest office in the or the highest elected office in the land, yeah, um, I think I think you can expect a smile. I don't think that's the end of the world. I mean, we are we are looking to try. You are trying to get a job that's worth like eighty thousand pounds a year. And has a, the power to destroy nations and stuff. Come on. I would agree yeah. that this would be a misapplication of that valid critique. And there we go. Feminists were at each other's throats. Exactly. <laughs> Cannibalizing one another. Uh, <laughs> I disagree with this person on this one particular point. Exactly. Ah, exactly. Oh, cat. But, but the, fact that we've, the fact that we've agreed on that means that we're also in an echo chamber. So we're cannibalizing one another in an echo chamber. And, yeah. Genius. Anyway, but on a sort of related note, which is an in-joke that people won't get that are listening to this, but fuck it, when have I ever cared about my subscribers? I, <laughs> whatever. Um, I was going to talk briefly about uh, the Dave Rubin situation. Are you, are oh, you aware please. of what's going on there? Uh, because of Twitter, yes, I am. Mostly because of uh, Tom Bloke 
uh, and Vadim, and uh, I think a few other people who are uh, tweeting. Uh, Anti-social media also had a few good tweets. So, but uh, for those who aren't in the know or who have lives outside of Twitter, could you uh, get everybody caught up? Yes, uh, Mother Jones, which I, I believe is a purely online publication. I'm very much mistaken. Back um, in the day, I think you can get a physical subscription, but they've put a lot of emphasis on their online publication. Yeah. I've only ever known it as an online thing, and certainly in this instance, uh, they put they published a an article on a, a friend of the channel, very much one of my muses, uh, Day Rubin, who is. Well, I'm going to assume you know. I'm not going to patronise you. You either know who he is or you fucking don't. I presume if you're subscribed to me, you sort of know who he is. Anyway, he used to work for the Young Turks. Now he's a right wing piece of shit. And anyway, in the article, he was described as far right. Heaven for fend. But um, he took that so, so poorly, even though he's a free speech warrior, that he threatened to sue Mother Jones over what is essentially an opinion piece. I mean, it's, it's so ludicrous as to be untrue. Shows up his nonsense about uh, free speech. And also, Dave, just on a, on a, a quick personal area, if you don't want to be seen as far right, then don't have people like Stefan Molyneux, Mike Cernovich, Paul Joseph Watson, Alex Jones, all these people uh, on your show and describe them as the new centre, which is his little phrase he's come up with for these people, and include yourself in that new centre. When these people are very, very obviously far right, if you then describe yourself as the same thing as them, you're saying, I am far right. Is that, is that a crazy analysis? You know, I just say, Dave Rubin, it kind of has uh, lifted my spirits since Kraut went offline, got banned from Twitter again within like 10 days of getting a new account. Because he, I, I, I never really understood lol cow, as in the schadenfreude of watching someone just completely yeah. melt down. Yeah, on Dave, media. well, Dave Rubin is. Yeah, and he's doing that. He's having a bit of a meltdown um, over this, you know, people describing him as far right. And the idea that you're going to sue, I mean, for defamation, it has to be false. And there's a good case content yeah. that it would be an accurate description. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. But that's the thing. And, and, when he has these far right people onto his show and just sits there nodding in agreement with what they're saying when they're spouting their far right shit, it's a pretty open and shut case. And he's talking shit. And of course, what about censorship, Dave? What about if someone had done that to you? Uh, I get called things all the time. You know, yeah. uh, there's only one person that I've talked about defamation um, because I understand the difference between you know, what people say in opinion and actually publishing false uh, accusations that damage someone's reputation. If this isn't going to damage his reputation. If anything, he's getting mileage out of it. The public, he's getting um, uh, publicity and also yeah, affirmation from to. the very people he's... Yeah, exactly, yeah. But aff affirmation from the very people who he's trying to appeal to, who are far right, by the way. So, you know. Uh, yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. I really don't but get that anyway. at all. Yeah. It, yeah. But basically, so this is this this stream isn't really about anything. I, I just thought I'd sort of bring that up. So, is there anyone? Is there anyone in the chat? I haven't even been checking. It might Apologies. just be a solo. <laughs> oh no! There's oh, there are 26 people watching. Good lord. Um, what are you people doing on a what is it tonight? Saturday? I lose track of the days now. It's just like focus group, focus group. Time to do a focus group. I could tell you a little bit about the findings if you wanted. Yes, please do. Yeah, Otherwise, you get just some questions. Lost. Yeah, whilst, she's, uh, whilst she, whilst the cat's mother is uh, getting the, um, that's a British phrase, but I'm sure that, that's probably sound sexist. What? Um, <laughs> if the cat's mother, basically when you refer to someone without using their name in a kind of derisive way, you go, oh, it's the cat's mother. It's a fucking weird British thing. Anyway. <laughs> uh, yes. That's, that's whilst, why we took the language away from you guys. Well, oh, well you destroyed it. I'm sorry, <laughs> you all dove. As, as a trickle fucking shortening, <laughs> you would have. Oh, yeah. You would have done all that. I'm sorry, that's not acceptable, Erica. <laughs> that's just not acceptable. Anyway, and uh, aluminum, get out of it. Anyway. What do you, what do you? What do you, yeah. Use guys, stop it. <laughs> y'all. Uh, y'all. <laughs> yes. Uh, whilst, whilst, whilst Christy. Uh, the, the the country bumpkin uh, American explains the incredibly brilliant piece of sophology she's got for us. Uh, questions in the chat, and uh, after that, I'll answer some questions as well. Anyway, you've got the floor. 
Well, it's not so much sophology because that would be surveys and the prediction of election outcomes. What we've been doing uh, since the 18th of May is going around the country doing focus groups and talking to voters both pre and post election. And I'm going to be doing a more extensive sh show with uh, hopefully both of the members of my team or team members. I guess there's sort of three investigators and we all divvy up the work. Uh, but it is my study. Uh, um, and I'm going to be looking to retire from the study soon. So I'm, I'm going to be leaving it in good hands. But anyway, uh, yeah, the pre-election stuff was was really interesting in a lot of different ways. One, um, it, what was so I'm going to go with the politics and then I'm going to go with the terrorist attacks. First of all, because in the end, w there was nothing in our data collection that showed the attacks had any impact on the election really whatsoever. I think one person uh, who was a conservative talked about security issues, but he was t speaking about them sort of digitally as well as national security. So it was more of a principal thing than a reaction to the attacks. But on the politics, what was interesting pre-election was that um, Theresa May, as you know from the polling, and Jeremy Corbyn were having um, different trajectories. So May started off high and ended up low. Corbyn started out low and ended up um, a bit higher. And early on in the focus groups, people were talking about the fact that, um, you know, for, for some of us, especially our conservative voters, having enough of a majority for a strong Brexit. People also talked about really understanding tactics why May would have called the election when she did and the benefits of having a stronger majority so she would have more negotiating power when she came back with something to be voted through Parliament. And I guess I was sort of surprised at the extent to which people were not that disappointed by how cynical a move it was. <laughs> it was um, I guess that's maybe the difference between you know being an American where we have fixed elections and then in, in the UK where calling an election when it's advantageous is just kind of what you do. But it, for, just again, as an outsider, it's it just people were like, yeah, you know, she was in a, you know, there was a good bump in the polls and um, she was going to go into the negotiation. So that was interesting because, you know, the, her rationale for the election was Brexit, but the problem was that for the rest of the country, they weren't voting on Brexit again. This was a general election, and it was about all kinds of issues. And some yeah, people... I, also, I was just yeah, going to say, ahead, it, was, it was really surprising how little that topic actually came up during the whole election, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, people in our focus groups talked about hard Brexit and soft Brexit, but then they would even say, I don't really know what those terms really mean and nobody's saying what would be the difference between a hard and a soft Brexit in terms of say the movement of people. So they heard the media echoes about these things but there was a lot of admissions of just a lack of clarity as to what the how those would be meaningfully different. Uh, but getting back to the election itself, um, generally a a over the course of it when the dementia tax especially started to hit we were seeing, um, basically, Theresa May was getting rated in our leadership evaluations as being a strong leader, but not being very personable. Um, and increasingly, that weakened to, you know, being uh, weak and wobbly as not as opposed to strong and stable, closer to the actual election day. And Corbyn started off um, with People basically saying uh, things like, oh, he, he seems like the kind of guy who'd wander up to you at a church fair with some organic honey that he'd cultivated from the bees in his backyard. Um, he, does make, <laughs> like, he does actually make his own jam. That actually yeah. is true. <laughs> um, and also we saw a real generational difference with the attacks. People over the age of, say, 45 and 50 would directly mention his connections to the IRA. Whereas younger voters, people younger than that, um, even though those media narratives were out there, they weren't repeating them in our focus groups. So we did see some generational effects of, in terms of discrediting Corbyn as, you know, being arm in arm with terrorists. Um, but as it went on, and this was where I think a tactical error was made by Corbyn, as people saw him speaking and saw him in the news and also he started to do more appearances, uh, you know, he, he showed up even though Theresa May didn't show up to one of the debates by the end. People said the more they saw him, the more they realized he wasn't the radical that the media was painting him out to be and they started to quite like what he had to say. And I think Corbyn really should have taken more advantage of this. And instead of saying, well, if Theresa May is not going to turn up to a debate, he should have been at every single one of those. And he should have been speaking because what we found was the more people saw him, the more they liked him.
And therefore, he really disadvantaged himself, in my opinion, at least, by uh, not engaging with the media content as opposed to the sort of stomping and doing the campaign stuff. Um, I so, can, I just, can I just interject slightly there, just, in, just to play devil's avocado? Um, <laughs> it's possible that had he turned up to those earlier debates, Theresa May would have seen that bounce in the polls and responded um, accordingly. And... She can be, I mean, she's, especially at Prime Minister's question, she can be quite good at dealing with Corbyn in a way that Corbyn doesn't seem massively able to handle. So if she turned up to one of the last sort of two debates, it's possible there might have been a counter reaction to that based on the strong and stable bullshit. And she'd have brought up IRA and all of that, so who knows. But I'm right. just, just, as, just as devil's advocate. If you haven't yet, there's an excellent, excellent piece in politico.eu, uh, Why May Lost, and they do a, a really good time sort of calendared analysis of how the, the election was called in a very surprising way, how the manifesto was crafted in the sort of, you know, back corners and smoke filled rooms, and then also their strategy. So they were so confident Corbyn was not going to be a threat by sort of the second or third week of the campaign, they had decided to attack Europe instead. And there was this whole thing in media about some leaked tapes, and they were trying to make the European negotiating team, because they wanted, again, to make the election about Brexit. So had Corbyn been going on TV, they wouldn't have, they'd already discounted him at that point. And they didn't really start to see the impact of, this is it, this like the collective thing of um, calling the election when she said she wasn't going to call the election, then doing the U-turn on the dementia tax, um, and she started to be seen as not being strong and stable. That was the thing that she was running on. And also her you know, distance um, and not really talking and engaging with people, avoiding the debates, all of this stuff. Um, basically, people didn't really have confidence that she was going to be able to you know, lead a government, and especially with her older voters. We found a lot of concern about uh, even the idea that they would just take your home. That was a terrible policy, and it got you know sort of distilled down in in the media to the concept of the dementia tax. But it was a great enough soundbite to really undercut her with her core support. And we saw um, conservative voters still planning on voting conservative because they didn't see Labour as a potential option, but just being so disappointed with how she conducted her campaign. Now, on that, I should say that you know um, there were at least from what the evidence that I saw, uh, a lot of people wanted labor to do well, but quite a lot of the movement, I think, is less in sort of a whole bunch of people discovering they're actually social democrats <laughs> and more to do with people really losing confidence with, with May and voting in a tactical way. I mean, come on, Kensington? You know, <laughs> it's yeah. not like they've, no, it's not like, yeah, there's not going to be free markets, you know, set up where people can just pick things up that have been donated, you know, man. Um, so, uh, you know, I think Corbyn actually could have done well, more can, to can. get to marginal seats where people were doing tactical voting uh, and take more of an advantage of it. Uh, I think he actually could have done better than being 60 seats short, which is where he ended up. Well, I'm just going to say also Canterbury, which had been Tory since 1918. But, yeah. Right. Um, but on the other side of the coin, you've got the Scottish Conservatives running a really great campaign on the threat of indie ref up in Scotland. Um, you know, so they managed to actually, um, you know, put up a, a, a campaign there where Labour didn't and ended up picking up seats that might have actually shifted over to a possible coalition on the left. So, again, I think that was another tactical error of not really paying attention to Scotland and how the how the Conservative Party was becoming the alternative for people who didn't want a second referendum. And that was really the kind of campaign that was going on up there, which Labour didn't counter. But it's certainly, I think, I certainly, it seems that they, they, the, the campaigning they've done focusing on England worked brilliantly well. Well, yeah, but I mean, you can't win with just England. That's, that's kind of the whole well, problem. Well, you can't, but if Scotland does eventually go independent, that groundwork might be very, very important going forward, just to... Well, yeah, I mean, I think there's the, the reason why the SNP saw such a surge in 2015 was because people who had voted Labour all their lives and their families had voted Labour going back, you know, to their grandparents, was they felt like they were just red Tories. They'd been so uh, consumed with finding the centre in England that they'd abandoned all the principles that really made them Labour. And in Scotland, they could get the SNP for basically the same 
po policies that they used to support the Labour Party for. So yeah, I think the Scottish Labour have um, their own issues uh, as well. But um, just a little bit about post-election, I guess. Uh, what we're seeing is some pretty uniform assessments of where the parties are. Most people consider the Conservative Party as, is really weakened and especially embarrassed going into the EU negotiations. They're concerned about the impact that that's going to have on Britain's ability to negotiate. Um, and some people more than others, obviously people who want a hard Brexit are more concerned than people who really would like to throw away the whole referendum on exiting anyway. So we've got a range of opinions there. Most people perceive labor as being uh, stronger. And what was interesting was when we asked people, how would you feel if there was an election called in the next 12 to 18 months? The most enthusiastic pro, yeah, let's go again, uh, voters were all labor voters. Because well, they surprising. are like, yeah, the, the yeah, most, they taste blood in the water. Yeah, the most recent poll uh, suggested labor would have a, if it was run, uh, you know, on the day that the poll was taken, uh, labor would gain a 12 seat majority. Which isn't a huge majority, but considering they were looking at being wiped out a month ago, it's pretty bad. Right, right. Uh, um, but the one thing that I would caution people who are a little bit maybe over exuberant in their labor happiness is one notice I, I picked up this time when people were discussing the future. There's a real difference in people who say the country's broke, we can't afford it, uh, we don't have any money left. And that ties on very much to concerns about immigration and concerns about like providing public services and other things that are very expensive, like healthcare. And people who frame Britain as a wealthy nation that has a lot of resources and is it has a history of compassion, um, you know, at least, you know, for the poor and, and, and that kind of thing. Um, those are the people who are obviously very much more on the left. And so I think in part, if labor wants to learn how to be successful going forward, they have to learn to talk to people who are convinced that there's no money left in the coffers and that Britain is up to its eyeballs in debt and things can't be, uh, you, you can't afford all these nice things. And under, have them understand how the numbers add up, feel like they're spending money we don't have. That would be my yeah. big conclusion for them. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's, that's wise on, on the national, well, on, even on the local level. But I mean, one thing I would say to them, and this is one of the reasons I'm not uh, running for office, is uh, what the fuck are you talking about, you mad bastards? We're about to spend a hundred billion on nuclear weapons. If yeah. We're, if we're that if we're that poor, how can we afford that? Well, yeah, and you always get people like people who are saying um, we need to do more about immigration and, and make the system better, but then uh, also complain about how somebody who is trying to immigrate from a Commonwealth country because they married a, a British citizen, um, how, how much money it costs and how long it takes. And like, but that was the conservatives who made it complicated and expensive. <laughs> and you're, you're voting yep. for them because of their immigration policies, but you don't like their immigration policies. I don't understand. <laughs> but yeah, that's how, you know, people kind of bifurcate things in their mind where they're not up on that, that all of the policy ins and outs. Right. We didn't get many questions, and the ones we did get are mostly silly, but I'm going to get through them anyway. Uh, question. Right. Why does Paddington have a lampshade on his head? He doesn't. It's a it fez. It's a fez. It's Come a, on, people. It's a separate hat. That's why they call him Paddy Two Hats, because he's got two fucking hats. Anyway, <laughs> um, so that's, that's that one taken care of. Yes, I still have a strike on my channel, which is why I'm doing the live stream on my second channel. Me too. You're starting to look more and more like Rory Katz. Did Rory consent to this? <laughs> I think you'll find I was here first, so he has to consent to my thing, Eugene. And there was one serious question. Any thoughts regarding Prime Minister May getting bundled away by security from angry residents of the Tower and nearby estates? Yeah, I don't know if people saw this. Um, uh, if, if you want to know a little bit more about the actual story itself, there's a thing on my main channel uh, a video. Uh, about this, the uh, Grenfell Tower fire and all that. And Theresa May reacted really poorly to it by basically not giving a shit, which is what we saw of what we were talking about earlier. Um, and then she, a couple of days later, having been shamed by all of the, even the right-wing press, said, what the fuck are you doing? So she went down there, 
uh, and went to a local church and the residents turned up and the security had to whisk her away as if she was in some sort of war zone. <laughs> Ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, if, you, if you're prime minister and you can't even, you're not even safe to walk the streets of your own capital, I'd suggest maybe quit. Just a thought. You know, if I were her PR people, I would have had her meet with small groups of the families at a time and just have her sit there and listen and shake her head and have her staff take notes and talk about how the local services are going to help them and she's going to stay personally involved and then bring in the next group and do the same thing again because even if people have an outburst, it would be easier to handle and she'd just sit there and accept it because she was there to represent the failures of the government. Yeah, and not not just that, but it's it's ridiculous to use the excuse of security reasons on the very same day that the Queen went there Prince William went there and Jeremy Corbyn went there. So clearly they, it wasn't the security problem wasn't for them, was it? And so also I mean, the common denominator is you don't turn up. That's on you. And also this is, you know, these are local ordinances. I know there was a bill that went through Parliament and, and stuff too that could be uh, it was a but it was a lot of it sounded like a lot of failed and she's not responsible for what happened on the local level. And I think it was she really over blew her security issue and then she made it a security issue. Yeah. By not oh, yeah, handling the thing, it correctly. Yeah, had she turned up on the day after, the morning after, met with people, I think she'd have probably been all right. But the fact that she didn't and has now been shamed into doing so means that she can't. She couldn't just turn up there now. There'd be a fucking riot. And there nearly was. Like I said, they had to whisk her away yeah. in a bomb-proof car. Well, technically she always travels in a bomb-proof car. Uh, uh, but, you know, she had to be whisked away. With, uh, behind a police cordon in the in the streets of the capital of the country. I mean, that's it really is. bad. To, I mean, for, for the woman that was running on strong and stable only a fortnight ago, this is <laughs> very very iffy. Uh, yes, I think you know um, the conservatives. One of the things that people mention in the focus groups is that they don't expect her to last very long because once things have sort of stable been stabilized in terms of how the supply and confidence arrangement is going to work, the long knives are going to come out. They all expect her, a lot of people anyway, yes. expect her to not be leader in another year because she's just done such a bad job. But they can't kind of take her out now because of the Brexit negotiations and everything else. But, yeah, so we'll see. Okay, serious question, which you might be able to give a bit more insight into. Um, do you believe Jeremy Corbyn will win a majority in the next election in the next six months? So there's sort of two questions in that, really, isn't there? Um. I don't see that. I think at this point, what it would take for there to be another election would be that the government would have to try to pass a bill and not have enough votes and then lose confidence and there would be a vote of no confidence. Um, uh, again, 60 seats is, is a lot to make up and Labour could have done more tactical work in potentially marginal seats. You know, they He stuck a lot to places that were strong Labour, um, that were Labour strongholds. So he went to places where he could draw big crowds, birdie sized crowds, and that looked really great. But he didn't spend enough time in places that he could flip. Um, so that would be a question if Labour could do that. And the other thing, too, is, is there enough people to make up a 60 seat deficit in six months? Or would you basically just have a very similar result by running the election again so soon? Would anybody have really moved? especially if they got rid of Theresa May, because once you remove Theresa May and her advisors in that manifesto and the dementia tax, a lot of the seniors will come back. Possibly. But maybe some of the seniors will be dead. So, you know, (laughs) Um, no offense. Rather morbid, morbid morbid political strategy. We'll just wait for the fuckers to die. True, but the baby boomers (laughs) really do need to fuck the fuck up right now, frankly. Or or you can find politics to win them over. You have to compete with them. No, 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 they just need to die. They just need to fucking (laughs) die already. They've elected Trump, they've done Brexit. They put fucking Marine Le Pen. Well, actually, no, to be fair, they, the majority of the older people voted against Le Pen in France. So maybe maybe the French old old folk can, can stick around for a bit, but the rest of them can fuck off. Anyway. And uh, this is um, all humor, people. Exactly. This is, I mean, there's no <laughs> way this video is going to get st- <laughs> cut <laughs> off <laughs> and distorted. I, do, I don't. I don't know if Corbyn's necessarily going to fire me as one of his strategists, which might be for the best, I suppose, but there you go. 
Um, what was uh, some of the questions? What did you think of Lord Buckethead? I, 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 the I, the, the, the Monster Raven Looney Party. No, yes, no, no. He's the Monster Raven Looney Party are quite quite tiresome for the most part. But he he seems like a decent enough chap. But yeah, he's he's not a he's not a monster raving loony. That guy was also on stage uh, along with Elmo. If you remember. Oh, what? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. I thought he was. I just assumed a, a, a idiot dressed like a twat called Lord Buckethead. He would be monster no, raving loony. No, that's what they generally do. He's got his own party, and he but wants to get rid of. He wants to get rid of all the lords except for him. <laughs> <laughs> Little house well, of lords. I can, I can get behind. <laughs> I can get behind that. See, there fine. you go. Yeah. One vote for Lord well, Buckethead. Some... Yeah, well, I don't, I don't live in the constituency, unfortunately. But there you go. Um, where are we? Don't you think the Democrats should focus more on fighting racist Jim Crow voting laws? I suppose. Yes. But, but yeah. I mean, the problem is that Democrats don't uh, have majorities in part because of those racist Jim Crow voting laws. Uh, because of gerrymandering in either the House or the Senate. Well, the Senate, that's not a fair assessment because it's too per state. So in the House and also in local elections. So that's why we really need a, a, a change election, like a wave election in 18, because the census will be taken in 2020. And it's always easier for an incumbent to hold on to a seat than it is for a challenger to overcome an incumbent. Even open seats are easier to be won than taking something away from somebody who's had that seat forever. So with Trump's approval ratings down in sort of like the 37 to 32 watermark, uh, we're going to be looking at the Georgia six congressional race as a really good watershed to see whether or not they can flip a district that really should have um, easily been won by the Republicans. So. Uh, but yes, yeah. we should be once we get power. Um, and then definitely, I think that um, I, I personally think that there should be federal voter civil rights acts where for federal elections, Congress has, um, it's in the Constitution when the election is set, so I think there's a reason there to say that it's within the constitutional right of Congress to set elections, and then also the conditions of those elections. So I think there should be six weeks of early voting. I think it should be, um, if you do have a valid ID that's listed, you should be able to do same-day registration. I think uh, you should be able to prove your ID with um, you know, things like bills and a checking account, not necessarily a photo ID for people who don't have that documentation. And I think that that should be how federal elections are won. And then if the states also want to tie their elections to those general elections and their primaries accordingly, well, those um, then they can. But hopefully they would you know, eventually have to do the same balloting process and accept the same ID because they're going to be running two elections simultaneously. That would be my strategy. Yes. Yes. Uh, what about all these fox hunter voters? You've got to get them. They're a key demographic. <laughs> yeah, actually, uh, to bring it back to the British election, yeah, the fox hunting thing was such a bizarre thing to do because the numbers, uh, I saw one poll that suggested that 90%, 90% of the country was against it. And yeah, that, that was one of the first things they announced, the Tories, when they were running for... I actually talked to someone who was pro fox hunting. And you just you go... one of them. Yeah. Oh. It was like, and then well, you know, the there's very little you can get any British people to agree on, and one of them is, yeah, let's not do the fox hunting thing anymore. Um, and yet, that was one of the first things they went with, and that was really a, 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 a bad omen for them. That that was the sort of uh, the point at which you think you look back and you think it all went downhill from that point very really. well. But anyway, um, is it okay for me to go out of my way to punch Richard Spencer's punchable Nazi face at every opportunity? I personally would say yes. How say you, Krista? So I've done a lot of thinking about this issue because it keeps getting thrown back in my face. Um, and I, when I was talking to uh, Wooly Bumblebee and her significant other, there was a point that we kind of came to that I think is my new position, which is if you wouldn't want to live under a fascist system, at some point, to Nazi. And the question is, what line has to be crossed for you to punch a Nazi? Is it when they're marching in the streets? Is it when they take over um, a significant portion of a political party? Is it when they take over a political party? Is it when they start getting elected to government? Is it when they start running government? You know, what point are you willing to defend democracy with? And that's the question I think everybody has to answer themselves. Uh, I'm not to the point where I'm ready to punch a Nazi. Um, but then, given that gradient, 
there are people who would be willing earlier than me to violently protect democracy in order to, <laughs> it's kind of a paradox that within democracy, you might not be able to allow every kind of speech. You might not be able to allow the speech that would actually overthrow the democracy you're trying yeah. to protect. Yeah, well, I, I, the old saying about freedom not being free, and yeah, that's true, it isn't free. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that means physical resistance against those that would seek to destroy, A, the system itself, and B, destroy human life. Now, the other part so, of that I mean, is... For me, Nick, what? Yeah, just to, if you think it's morally justified, it's still criminal. So, just oh, because yeah. you feel morally justified in punching a Nazi, you should fully expect to be arrested and to be taken to court, and you can plead guilty, because you would be, and then do community service or go to jail for a pe period of time. Those are the other yeah. side, that's the other side of it, too, is you have yeah, to bear the I, consequences I, of your actions. Exactly. Well, and not just that, but obviously the informal consequences of Nazis, they are still humans and are going to fight back. So there's, there's, there are costs to pay, but for me, and this might sound a bit grandiose possibly for what is essentially an act of violence, uh, but I, I see it as my solemn duty to protect uh, just human life, human decency. Um, possibly take that on myself, if that makes sense. Like, that seems like a sacrifice worth making. And, as I, said, and I don't have a criminal record, so first offence, I'll be all right. Before. And being in Europe, and, and as I said, you know, a lot of people who take this um, more uh, extreme, like, no, we should allow all kinds of speech views, tend to be Americans, uh, sometimes Canadians, who've never lived under a fascist regime or had one bombing their country. Now, of course, there well, was Pearl Harbor, but it was a military, um, out, you know, installation, and it was not on the mainland. You know, um, we've had terrorist attacks, but we've not had a sustained attack or threat of attack or bombings from a fascist government that sought to destroy our democracy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, American democracy really threatened. Even the American Civil War was essentially a battle between two democracies, albeit with the slavery thing means that mm -hmm. millions of Americans were not living in that democracy, if that makes sense. But in essence, there was two democracies battling the one. Uh, really, the same sort of thing. Even so, most American most threats to America have been from essentially America. Yeah, the greatest crisis, yeah, our greatest national crisis in terms of a war was the Civil War. Yeah. Uh, but it was an existential threat. Exactly, yeah. yeah. It, was, it was two ideas of what democracy should be rather than one, side, one destroying, trying to destroy the other, if that makes sense. Yep, exactly. Well, think, it's like how the Canadian, you know, people copy you your want. form of government. You know, people have a, a parliamentary system of government with prime ministers, and that's basically, even though they broke away from Britain, they basically became another version of it in terms of its government. Well, they haven't really broken away from Britain, because in order to call a part, uh, an election in Canada or America or New Zealand well, and various other places, they have to go yeah. to London to ask the Queen to dissolve that's the Parliament so in Ottawa <laughs> or, or Canberra or in, um, is it Christchurch or Wellington, wherever in, Austin, in New Zealand? Um, yeah, which is just bizarre. I want to see the Queen go on strike. In Australia, presumably. <laughs> go on the strike. Prime, yeah, the Prime Minister has to ring up, presumably, in the middle of the night in order to make sure that there's daytime <laughs> in London to get through. <laughs> Otherwise, you just go, well, can we have a pro an election? Well, she's in bed. Fuck off. <laughs> ring back in 12 hours, you prick. So, ring up right before difficult. you go to bed. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Just before you go to bed, ring up, and you know, in theory, she could say no. She won't. That's, to be fair, the Queen, I mean, I'm against the concept of monarchy in general, but in terms of being a constitutional monarch, she's played it to a T, really. No, I, I think that would be uh, great if she just went on strike and refused to do that, and just like, see what you guys are going to do now, huh? <laughs> yeah. Well, technically, in Britain, we've already got the law in place, which would allow, which if, 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 if I think it's called something like um, monarch, monarchal frustration of Parliament or something, um, whereby Parliament could bypass uh, the Queen and, in theory, dissolve the monarchy completely. Actually, but um, well, yeah, then so basically, would if she refused, Parliament. if she re well, no, that's the thing. The Queen would be removed from that process, so, so it, would be, it would be down to the, the cabinet. Although, well, technically, technically, the Prime Minister would make the decision, but the cabinet would have to approve it. I think. But anyway, yeah. So okay. if the Queen 
explain a bill or something, they could enact that law. But well, the law is enacted, the provision within the law could be enacted uh, by cabinet, by, or I think parliamentary, by one of them, uh, and they could bypass the claim. Which is fair enough, I think that's uh, that's perfectly fine. But you just think, well, actually, well, actually the, the bizarre thing of, if you remember, and I don't know if you do necessarily, because you obviously, I don't know if you were living here at the time, but when the uh, the royal baby, the, the female royal baby, was being born, and they've subsequently changed the rules of succession mm. to it now being the oldest heir, rather than it being the oldest male heir, mm-hmm. and then the next male heir, and then eventually it gets to the women. And you think, well, okay, let's well, sort of step forward or whatever. Um, but the reason it was given for that was, oh, we, we need to get rid of this medieval concept, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> you think, they're talking about that within the framework of <laughs> the, the, them coming out of the right set of testicles and ovaries. They're God ordained. Yeah. Like it's all medieval that was... bullshit. Why rid of this specific tiny bit of medieval bullshit and keeping the rest of it? It's like trying to sweep up a fucking earthquake with a dustpan and brush. It's ridiculous. What are you doing? Yeah, you guys anyway, have a lot sorry. of you know. If it was an evolutionary biology as a comparison, you know, like the t- like the the queen is like the wisdom teeth, you know, of of your de- democratic development, and that. <laughs> You're gonna have to explain that because that makes no sense at all. All right, so you have a more um, less developed form of democracy, right? But then you have these incidents that happen, like Magna Carta, and then you have Cromwell's Revolution. You have the Restoration, and so you have this, um, you know, whereas in France, the government was controlled almost entirely by the aristocracy, and the monarch was, you know, absolute ruler. Because in Britain, you have this weird vestige of a royal role for legitimacy and also because of the role of uh, being the head of the church. It, you can't just abolish it. You know, the French who were Catholics and the Spanish, whatever, they weren't they didn't claim to be the head of their churches. So there was a unique union. And you also had the commons, which had a, a pretty you know, an increasing role in, in the government. And so that was what got exported. Um, and so even though it's a representative democracy, it's got the House of Lords, which is left over, and people have tried to, tried to modernize the second house, and it's just a disaster because it's unelected. And so they try to get experts in there, but it's always partisan, and it's just a fucking mess. Um, but you can't just destroy it because you need an upper house, so you're stuck with this crappy version. It just kind of keeps limping along, <laughs> and this is what I mean about how it's evolved over time and it has these sort of weird vestiges that just like it doesn't kill it off but it doesn't make sense to have it like wisdom teeth yeah oh okay i'm, I'm with you right uh, yeah but my, I, I mean i don't know how you would feel about this but my solution to the house of lords and its legitimacy would be to have Your sound totally cut out, so I actually have not heard a thing you've said. <laughs> it started with your explanation. I don't know if you've muted yourself or whatever, but I can't hear a thing. I don't know if people in the chat can hear you, or, but I certainly can't. I don't know if your lead got disconnected. I was really disappointed because I was so looking forward to your answer. No. I can't see the sound coming up when you talk, if that makes Hello. Oh, now I can hear you. Hey, Hello. you're back. Right, okay. So my no, my fancy microphone is now off, so you're going to have to put it with my shitty microphone. <laughs> anyway, my solution to the House of Lords. You'd keep yeah. some of the good old bits that will actually do work and are quite good, and you'd modernise it by having a genuine legitimacy based on popular public vote. You'd have it directly elected, but on proportional representation grounds. And before the election, each party would come up with their their long list. So you'd have like their number one uh, lord, the lord that would basically remain, if they got like one vote, they'd have one lord of them. Um, uh, and then all the way down, based on order. And so if they got enough votes in the popular vote, the overall popular vote in the whole country, uh, they'd for 20 lords out of, say, let's say they had 800 lords or something, then you'd have the top 20 on that long list would be elected to the House of Lords for that party. And they'd have to produce that before the election, if that makes sense. So you know who you're electing potentially and the quality of those people. And those people can be directly scrutinised by the voters before the election. And you'd have it on a genuinely proportional basis. 
and that would therefore mean that you'd have elements of proportional representation so that the vote didn't count at all. Because even if their 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 commons um, representative wasn't the person they voted for, their vote would still count towards that party in the Lords. If that makes sense. That could be a possibility if Lords no longer yeah. meant like the Lord title. Right, because they'd be elected and then they'd be booted out. So it might be some yeah. people were there on a consulting basis, maybe like an, um, a non-voting what, what, basis. What, what, what other thing, are, that, actually, one, one element I didn't bring up, the Lord's title, and I think that's wise and modern and all the rest of it. Because actually one of the annoying things is the Queen's speech, right, one of the reasons, one of the excuses given for it being delayed till it was supposed to be on Monday, it's not going to be on Wednesday, was that this by law it has to be the Queen's speech has to be written on goat skin parchment. And apparently that takes several days to dry in order for them to write. And you think Parliament has been telling the British people for the last fifty years it needs to modernise. All the time you need to modernise this, modernise that. And yet you're gonna have a guy called Black Rod bang on a door. <laughs> a fucking ninety year old who came out the right set of bollocks and vagina fucking a hundred years ago or ninety years ago, whatever, right? Who's then going to read a load of old shit on gold on goatskin parchment while sitting on a fucking throne in one of her million palaces, telling the country that they need to modernise? Fuck off! Wait, how hypocritical can you possibly get? Yeah, yeah. you guys do democracy weird. Not that True, we're much. We have, we, yeah, we, I was about to say, considering who your head of state is right now, I'm not sure America's yeah, really. Yeah, rub it in, rub it in. That, that's hurt. Hurt. that hurts. That hurts. Because, especially because the, at least our prime minister is the person who got the most votes. That I mean, that is literally true. So. Yeah, I was kind of comparing, saying. like you know, if um, Bernie, you know, or sort of um, if Corbyn, I guess so much of his um, victory was expectations, and I did see him with Andrew Marr, and Andrew Marr said, "So you lost the election." And Corbyn says, well, we didn't win the election. And I just thought, yeah. <laughs> that's a tautology, mate. It doesn't sound any better. Like, yeah. I know you did better than expected, but if you want to actually make the changes, you have to win. You have to win all of the seats you need to have a majority, or at least go into coalition, um, which yeah. is, I think, another tactical error that if they wouldn't have, you know, people might have voted differently in Scotland if there had been an, an actual opportunity to unite against the Tories, against austerity. True, but one of the problems the Tories are going to have, which might bring down the government, is that even with the DUP, they lose, they would still lose their majority on matters that are undevolved. Yes. In in the House of Commons, there are some bills that affect everyone, and so all of the MPs get to vote on that. But for things that are devolved to the Scottish administration, and indeed when the Northern Ireland administration is sitting, which it isn't, because it's the Northern Ireland's a fucking mess anyway. Um, it's been yeah. worse in the past, but it's a mess. But anyway, for things that are dealt with by directly by the Scottish Parliament, is and that being MPs who are elected in Scotland rather than Scottish MPs in English seats, don't get to vote. And because the Tories did quite well in Scotland, they lose their I think it's their 19 seats or whatever in Scotland, and so they then lose their overall majority, <laughs> which means potentially for things that affect England and Wales, like. They could still, even though they have, in theory, a majority, they could still very much lose, even if all of their MPs vote for it. So that that might bring down the government, possibly, but we'll see. What a mess. What a mess she's made. Yeah, what a mess. What a mess she's made, and brilliantly, but all of the shit bits from the manifestos, they've had to drop now. Oh, yeah. Because it wouldn't have gotten through. Even, even with the DUP, fuck something, had no chance. They, they, she needed a 70, 80, 90, 100 majority to get that through. Because loads of Tories would have voted against it. Because, like I said, 90% of the country are against it. And Tory MPs, I hate them, but they're not fucking stupid people. They're not going to go yeah. with something that's so incredibly unpopular. It's certainly enough of them weren't. Uh, so that's not getting through. Grammar schools, like I say, education's devolved, so they don't have the majority. So that's going to have to go. Because there's no way the SNP or Labour or the Dems are going to vote for that. So that's that's out of the window. The dementia tax was already sort of dropped even before the election. That's gone. They're going to have to keep a triple lock on pensions. Basically, yeah. not, nothing they plan to do, they're going to be able to do. This Queen's speech is going to be so pointless. It's a waste of, of goat skin parchment, frankly. They must yeah. well write on the back of an envelope. It would mean just as much. Get out the 2015 manifesto, because that's about the only thing that they can cite. Yeah. Exactly, yeah, it's it's ridiculous, but 
going to be it's going to be fun times if nothing else. Well, you yeah, might, we've been. You might be back in the. You might be back in the country that. before the end of the year, before <laughs> the end of twenty seventeen. <laughs> Oh, well, you don't like it here. Well, fuck off then. No one invited you. So, <laughs> these just, foreigners coming over here. <laughs> studying our politics. <laughs> helping us understand things better. Exactly. Damn them all the help.